Joining us now is Scott Ford, CEO of Westrock Coffee, the brand behind the brands that provides 20 million cups of coffee to the world daily. Westrock is the largest custom private label coffee and tea provider in the United States to restaurants. Thanks for joining the Fools, and it's a pleasure to meet you, Scott. <laughs> joining the Fools. Well, I feel like I've been here my whole life. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> five minutes Five minutes can certainly seem like a long time during soundcheck. Um Let's get. Uh, I want to start with with the founding. I've heard you say that you started Westrock out of anger or enmity. Um, <laughs> so, so what? Uh, talk to me about the founding. Why, what were you so angry about? Yeah. So, uh, well, I was. I found myself in Rwanda through a, a long story that we would go into a, another time. But I was looking around at the economic activity, and I realized that coffee was the largest cash crop that was sold by. For the most part, people that live in rural countryside and lived uh, what they call smallholder farmer live, uh, lives, and uh, it's largely a barter society. So people grow extra vegetables and trade and things of that nature. And the cash crop was coffee, and it was 40% of the money, hard dollar currency that came into the country. And it happened to be purchased by these two individuals that, that financed the local mills, and they were only two mills. And coincidentally, through just, you know, I'm sure a bad stroke of luck, they offered the same price every day. And that price was half what all the coffee in that region of the continent sold for where there were multiple competitors. So I was angry that two guys were profiteering on the backs of some of the poorest people in the world. And I said, let's build a coffee mill. And that's how West Drop Coffee was born. And multiple businesses have, have been born out of your your margin is my opportunity. But and when I've heard you, you tell this story, did you ever interact with those uh, the coffee buyers that were setting the prices? Because I, I can't imagine that they were delighted to have someone kind of come in and and mess mess with their market. Yeah, so I remember we'd we'd been up for a couple of weeks, and the guys in the uh, uh, that were running the factory for me, um, they called and said, "Well, we got this strange phone call." They they kind of welcomed us to the market, and they reminded us that the price was something other than what we were offering. And I, they said, what do we do? And I said, ignore them and raise the price you offer on the street. So another week went by and this time they were really mad. You know, and they, they said, what do we do? And I said, it's easy, ignore them and raise the price again. They'll eventually they'll understand that we're not going to talk about that. And then the third time somebody got threatened and you know, it kind of, it got ugly. And then we took the price to 90 cents. So we'd started at like 55, went 65, 75, and then we're at 90. Well, six or eight weeks later, they finally matched our price, but only after they were sure that we weren't going anywhere and and uh, they weren't going to bully us back out of it just because they didn't they didn't like our price. Right. We'll skip forward a few years. Now you have a company. It's 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 on the market. It's or, uh, and it's a dual purpose business. So, what does it mean to you to be running a dual purpose business? Well, I think any business that's going to really survive and thrive has to be a commercial enterprise first. And anything that is dependent upon charity, as I tell people all the time, you know, charity is great, but it sucks as a business model. So uh, the one time that you really need money, if you're out and you're asking for people to either pay you a premium, which is a form of charity, or subsidize your losses, which is a form of charity, then you really aren't running a sustainable business. And so if you just follow that logic, sustainability equals profitability. Now you get to the question of, well, what do you do with your profits? And uh, that's the great that's the great part of, you know, the, the 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 free trade system is you as the generator of the profit get to decide what you want to do with it. We reinvest ours back in farmers, farmer education, agronomy training, expanding the footprint. We started in Rwanda. We're in 35 countries now. We underwrite the daily price for millions of farmers in 35 different countries from the work that we do on the ground. But the way we do that is we sell a commercial product, better product, better price, better service. And we win so that we are assured of making a profit, so that we're assured of being on the ground again tomorrow with fresh money to buy tomorrow's crop. Uh, what's, what's the kind of, I want to hear about the farmer education program. What's the kind of education that you're providing to those farmers? And you know, how do you ensure when, when dealing with these smallholder farmers, which are working on, in many cases, one to two acre plots of land, that you're getting a consistent product for your customers? So you have to be with them every year. You know, you're, we're with them multiple times a year. So it really comes down to you have to have a good program design. It was ours was designed by a woman uh, that went to the Texas A&M University, 
who went to Rwanda and lived over there for six or seven years and literally watched all the nonprofits that were trying to do things. And she watched their struggles. And then she just converted where they were struggling back into the local language of, hey, would you like to make more money? We can show you how. So instead of approaching them with a, we believe this, or we believe that, or we think you would, your life would be better if you did the phone, we just simply said, hey, would you like to make more money? Well, all of a sudden, they were very open to all the things we then had to say. And so it's a basic agronomy training is free in America. It's available through every county extension agent, through the land grant universities, all through the farming belt here in the United States. It goes back to post-Civil War. It doesn't exist in many parts of the developing country, so the, the private sector has to take it with them. So we, when we go, we, she designed the program around three basic things. Number one, how do you become a better farmer? That gets down to when do you prune, when do you fertilize, what kind of fertilizer do you use, what do you pick, what do you not pick, what do you recycle, how do you uh, treat your water, how do you keep the water clean that you're going to be using on your coffee washing, things like that. The second stage is you've got to know your numbers. If you don't know your numbers, you will go broke no matter how good a quality crop you grow and how many uh, beans you bring in. So then the third thing is now that you're a better farmer, now that you're a better record keeper and you know how to stagger your income uh, out over the year for your expenses, how do you reinvest in your local community so that your children get the benefit of the work you're doing and a leg up to continue to work your way out of poverty? And it's the same system that worked here in the United States. It's the same system that was in rural Arkansas when my grandparents lived a very similar life. And two generations later, you know, the whole world has changed. But it takes it's a couple of three generation effort. Is this is there like an on the ground marketing effort to get more coffee farmers to sell to West Rock, or at this point is it mostly word of mouth? Uh, at this point, it's mostly word of mouth, but it's really farmer to farmer, and then we'll we have to kind of get enough of them together in a typically in a co op to then have a group that's big enough to then put somebody on full time that's training those farmers, and so we kind of grow it in the pod structure. Talking about your business, West Rock specifically, uh, you've chosen to be the brand behind the brands. Very often, if you're drinking a cup of West Rock coffee, you probably don't know it if you're at a quick service restaurant or at a, at a convention center or a gas station. So what's the advantage for when, when you saw this mar the, the market opportunity, what was the advantage in not really building your own brand as rest West Rock, but rather supplying others? Yeah, that's a great question, Ricky. And, you know, it, it, in, in all honesty, we were just kind of fumbling our way forward through it. But what we learned um, that cemented this was the right path for us was really two things. Our business model is built around creating volume, what we call a vacuum to pull coffee up into the into the supply chain, because if the bigger the demand we have, the bigger the demand pull, the more lives we can impact with a fair price on the ground in more and more countries. So that's the reason for the business. That's what we chose to do with the profits that we made from the sale of Alltel. It's what we chose to do with the profits that we generate in West Rock Coffee. That's the mission. Well, it then so happens, and I wouldn't really have forecasted this, it's, it happens that other people like buying from, major brands like buying from someone that's not in the brand competition business with them. The major restaurants appreciate the fact that they don't care if we sell to other restaurants. They actually know that we get scale. That helps them have a better price point. We develop new products. That helps them expand their menu. But they don't want us on the store in the shelves competing with them. And that ripples through the retailers, the private label business we do. And so we did it for the reasons of creating the broadest demand pull we could. And it just happened to have been reinforced by the fact that people like you treating them like they're the like they're the customer and not just somebody you take care of if you've got excess volume uh looking around amazon i'm starting to see west rock coffee branded uh k-cups ground coffee on there so how does the private label west rock fit into your business now yeah so when we started it no one would buy from us no one would finance us no one would lend us money no one would buy from us so we started west rock coffee simply as um an avenue to buy coffee on the ground in east africa <clears throat> that we could blend in with Brazilian, Colombian here and hit the American profile, taste profile, and the and a price point. So we had three people that were willing to do business with us in the very beginning. One was the retail buyer of coffee at Walmart. One was the uh, the guy that ran uh, that runs Omni Hotels. 
and the other one was the retail buyer in Kroger. And they said, we know you have no advertising. We know you plow all your money back onto the ground. We know we're going to have to carry the the, the uh, selling pressure advertising for you, but we love what you're doing and we're going to help you. And, and so the products that are out under the West Rock name are really the residual tail of where we started. It's less than 1% of our business today. Um, it sounds like you have a great relationship with a lot of uh, coffee sellers, but one, it sounded like you had a contentious relationship was with Keurig when you took on uh, when you started selling K cups. Uh, how did you take on Keurig, and what was the process like? Of yeah, what was the process like taking on Keurig so you could start selling K cups? Well, it was radically different than our experience in Rwanda. You know, uh, Keurig is a Keurig Dr. Pepper. They're a great business. They are run by high class people. They made a great product. They created this space. Uh, they simply got to a place where their patents expired. Well, I used to run a, a, a business that had a local phone, telephone business in it that was a monopoly. Then we got into the wireless business. It was a duopoly. So I was familiar with the price point pressures and the market share kind of decision path that somebody that was coming out of a monopoly into a competitive uh, situation might experience. But they handled it with, you know, we just went in and said, look, we're going to try and make the best product we can and sell it at a reasonable price. We know they're not going to come down to our price anytime soon because they don't want to reprice their base. So I think we're the second largest behind them today in the private label business. But uh, there's not great data on that. We may be third. Uh, but that's always been professional and straightforward. And, and frankly, they are one of the original pioneers of buying traceable, you know, what we would call sustainable coffee. The original guys that bought that to give them their credit were Keurig Dr. Pepper and Starbucks. And everybody else looked at us like we had three heads. And so tip of the hat to those guys for, for being early, not only with products that they invented, but also on the sustainable uh, supply chain side of it. I want to get to the traceable supply chain uh, um, conversation in a moment, but do you think there's an opportunity for similar? Do you think there's an opportunity for a similar disruption with uh, Nestle and Nespresso, those those hyper expensive pods? So uh, they went through a similar phase as as Keurig. Their their patents came off in Europe. I'm much less familiar with this than than the than the K cup side of it. Uh, there are a number of people in Europe that are now competing with them on a private label basis. There are a number of people here. Um, if, you know, if we've told people, if you want to buy them, uh, it's just a machine. And frankly, the machine's easier to run for, for those pods, we're told, than the K-Cups. Uh, they're much more straightforward because they're aluminum and you're not welding paper and plastic together. Um, but we haven't ever, we haven't personally, we haven't gotten into that business. Yeah, I'm ready to stop spending a buck per per Nes Nespresso <laughs> pot of coffee. So that that was the buy or that was the the why I asked that question. Let's talk about the fully digital, uh, the fully digitally traceable supply chain because that's one of your key differentiators at Westrock. Um, so why is this important to you as a brand? Because for very often, if a customer is drinking Westrock coffee, they don't know that it necessarily came from you. So uh, what is the advantage or? Why is it so important to you in having these digitally traceable supply chains? And are all what's the customer uptake like on that? Yeah. So it goes back again, Ricky, to the what's the reason for the business? Well, the reason for the business, we wanted to make an impact in the cash income and therefore livelihoods of literally tens of millions of uh, smallholder farmers around the world. That's the purpose of the business. But I'd hate to spend my whole back half of my career and not know whether I was having that impact or not. So we created traceability, not just so that we could see who owned it, but we wanted to know, did we make a difference in our income? So we did a bunch of studies on, well, what did they make before we got here? And then what happened to their quality of their crop, the quantity of their crop, the price that we were able to get for it. And then we, of course, we started originally balancing our, our books, if you will, when we were looking at, at the volumes we were buying. We started with a text message literally the, out on the border of Congo and Rwanda, the guy would go around and buy coffee in the morning and get to a high spot and text message back into Kigali, who would then send me an email and then we would take a counter position in the futures market. That's literally where our digital traceability started. Today, uh, one of the largest retailers in the world uh, has been collecting this data for years. They put a bag of coffee up, you can scan it with a QR code and I can tell you the farmer's name, whose coffee's in it, their name, the price that we paid them, the quality that they brought in, the quantity, they, whether they uh, brought in a better or worse crop last year, whether they've been through agronomy training, whether the farm has been inspected that year or not. So there are 
big customers that have been collecting that data from us. Now you go back again to the same thing. Why do we do it? Well, I don't care if we get credit for it. I want the volume. So if I have a better product, a better price, and a better service, and then I give them that kind of digital traceability, I have armed the largest retailers and restaurants in the world with the right to demand of everyone else in the coffee supply chain to see their digital record all the way back to the farm. Because if we can do it, they can all do it. It took us six years and we took a team and we moved them two years in the US, two years in Africa, two years in the UK, and then back. But if we can do it, they can do it. And that's why we do it. And the fact that no one knows it's us, I don't care. My customers know it's us and that helps us pull volume up in the supply chain. Uh, managing your supply chain has to be complex. I know there's an asset management component where you're ma uh, trying to uh, soften, I guess, the variability of coffee prices. You're, you're tracing it all the way through. Uh, were there any companies that you looked toward for supply chain management lessons or ones that you particularly admired as you were building this fully digital uh, uh, traceable supply chain? Well, th that's a generous question because it, it implies that I had enough insight or, or breadth of understanding to, to have first of all, understood what anybody else was doing, and second of all, to have appreciated it. And so I'm going to have to dodge that one because we literally, I came out of the telecom and investment banking world. I've been in the M&A world. I had never done this. Uh, we basically, the only people that would join me in the early days were people who said, I believe in your mission. Uh, we've got some of the world's great experts uh, around us today in manufacturing, sales, and training. But in the early days, it was just a bunch of us who said, we can make a difference here. Let's just go figure it out. That's that's okay. I appreciate you saying I'm dodging your question directly rather than just dodging the question. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll switch gears a little bit then because you're in the commodity business. I'm sure there's other people selling coffee out there. Uh, let's say I'm a quick service restaurant with 300, 300 locations across the United States. Um, what's the value proposition? Is it is it the traceable supply chain? Is it consistent pricing? You know, and who are your competitors for this kind of deal? Yeah, super. All right. So first of all, you're in business to make money. So the first thing we're going to come up to you do is say, how do we help you make more money? So you've got to make more money by selling more volume, or you've got to be able to, to uh, sell it at a higher price, or you've got to buy it cheaper. That's it, right? So what, you, what you're what you going to want to explore quickly is we can all make cheap coffee, hot black coffee, and sell it to you cheap. There's no margin in that business, right? So then the question becomes, well, what else are you going to sell up and down the counter? And there are people who go uh, and say, we're going to give you the equipment to sell all sorts of sugary, syrupy drinks, et cetera. Or you'll, you'll run into people like us who say, you know what we're going to do? We want to expand your portfolio, Mr. Restaurant Chain, not only for hot black coffee or iced tea. We're the largest provider of, of iced tea, but we'll also do extract drinks. So you want to make a, a mocha shake, a coffee shake. You want to do an espresso-based drink. You can, do, you can do cold brew coffee or iced coffee with cream in it out of a pump bottle. So this, this whole concept of taking coffee and bake it and, and basically distilling it to a syrup that you can then rehydrate in any form factor makes it easy for you because you don't have to have employees making it. It's in a pump bottle. You hit the pump twice, you put the ice cream in it or you put the cream in it and the drink is ready to go out the door. And the margins for you as an operator on that beverage are some of the highest margins you're gonna make. So we've got an entire team of product development and marketing insight people who are available free of charge to you 24 365. Let's help you develop a product set that'll help you win against your, your, your competitors down the street. And when we develop one of those products, we make more money on one of those products than we do all the hot black coffee ground business because there's no margin in it. It's just a commodity processing uh, exercise that you go through. It's, it's working as a market research group in some ways in one, uh, one one key area I've heard your company is capitalizing on is is ready to serve cold brew drinks. Um, in late 2021, Westrock uh, purchased it was more than half a million square feet foot plant in Conway, Arkansas. I believe you're also expanding in, in Malaysia. Um, what are these What are these expansions going to allow your company to do, and how are they going to help you better serve your customers, particularly in that quick service space? So it's the quick serve restaurants, the C stores, and frankly, this is one of the things that people don't really appreciate. We make a lot of coffee and coffee-based drinks for other coffee brands. So not only restaurants that you might drive through, but coffee brands that you go to Walmart, Kroger, you know, Safeway, and buy uh, off the shelf or out of the cold, out of the cold uh, section uh, aisle of the grocery store. 
So what we're going to do in Conway is we're going to build the world's, we think, largest roast to ready to drink facility. So we'll, we will bring it in green, clean it, roast it, grind it, extract it, concentrate it, add milk, sugar, flavors, et cetera, put it in a can, eight ounce, 11 ounce, 15 ounce can, regular size, slim size, put it in a multi-serve bottle, put it in a glass line, et cetera, and ship it out the back door um, to your distribution center. So restaurants, as they've moved from everybody comes and eats in to they drive through or they order it delivered, they can't sell a drink with their meal anymore. That's the highest margin part of their ticket because you can reheat your sandwich, but you can't unmelt your drink. So all of a sudden customers are saying, I love your iced tea or I love your mocha frappuccino, but not in that styrofoam cup. And so restaurants are talking to us about putting their products in cans that they can push through the drive through or the delivery system. But most of that is our consumer products, group customers, other coffee brands that are gearing up to sell through retailers and C-stores. Makes a lot of sense. We've got a lot of investors in the audience watching right now who, who are looking at, the, looking at the financials. And West Rock is profitable on an operating income basis. That's not something that a lot of your coffee competitors can say. But Westrock is not profitable on a free cash flow basis. A common drumbeat for investors right now is I'm not investing in unprofitable companies. So what do you say to those investors watching right now? Well, by the time you figure out that we're free cash flow positive because we've built the facilities that we're building around the world and we've filled them, it will be too late. Right? Because we can, you can buy us right now at $10, $10 a share. If you run through the math that we've, that we've shared with people about if we build these facilities, and we've already oversubscribed, filled them. So if we build them and we execute against the model, by the time we do that, and we will we will pay all our debt off in two years, and the stock will have long since eclipsed anything that people today would have looked around and said, "Hey, I should have bought it when." But you know what? That's normal. When I was at Altel, everybody hated on us because we were a sub-regional and we we weren't Verizon. We killed them in stock price appreciation while being you know kind of fool slap the whole time because we were smaller or because we were investing in a network at a more aggressive level than some of our competitors. But that's the nature of the game. And that's okay. I, I've heard you talk about your time at Altel. And one of the things you've brought up is that in any business, what is what is it? The, the verbs stay the same, but the nouns change. Right. And w one area where I'm sure you're bringing over a lot of lessons learned is in M&A. So what are some of the lessons that you've learned from Altel with regard to mergers and acquisition that you're now seeing play out in your time at West Rock Coffee? Well, most, most M&A activity is value destructive. So for it to be value accretive, two things have to be true. It has to truly be an extension of the network for your customers or the product set for your customers or the geography that your customers are interested in. Buying. It has to work for your customers first. And then number two, it has to be a business where you can culturally stand each other and you think you serve the same basic purpose. If you get either one of those wrong, you can forget it. Um, I know you don't reveal who your customers are. So while investors watch the growth and health of your business, what are the metrics that you would suggest that we look out for? Yeah, so we basically have uh, what we focus on is just growing our dollar EBITDA. Our prices fluctuate. The coffee price fluctuates. Our packaging prices fluctuate. Our freight prices fluctuate. We don't pass any of those through real time, but they're all passed through on a one or two quarter delay. So over a long period of time, what we're trying to do is grow our dollar based EBITDA, which means we have to grow our customers, grow our volumes, grow our product set, grow the geography we can deliver it to. And what Conway really represents is if you go back just for a second, when we started the the, ex, the export business, we then bought a trading business. After we bought the trading business, you couldn't even find the export business in the financials. It was so much bigger. After we started the um, export, the trading business, we started the roast and ground business and we got into the K-Cup private label business. When we did that, you couldn't even find the EBITDA of the trading business or the export business. It was a vestigial tail, if you will. When we bought S&D, we tripled the business again. When we turn Conway on, you're going to see the same effect. You won't even recognize the financials once those assets are, are, are finished, up and running, and coming through the P&L. You'll see that same kind of radical 3, 4, 5x step 
an increase, I think, in the profitability of the business. So there is no other thing than just managing the growth of the, of the profit stream. And when we finish building facilities, most of that EBITDA then turns around and flows right back down to free cash flow. You got to invest in the business in order to grow it. As we come to the end of this conversation, we've talked about um, ready to. We've talked about cold brew ready to drink. We've talked about digital traceable supply chains, digitally traceable supply chains. Excuse me. Um, is there a is there a trend in coffee that you're particularly excited about or interested in? Well, the trend, the ultimate trend, the ultimate um, proof in the pudding is not whether or not we capture what the customer wants. We're going to do that. Uh, working with our customers, we're going to capture what the American consumer is interested in. And we'll expand that footprint overseas because as American tastes go, generally speaking, they go elsewhere in the world as well. Um, the, the proof in the pudding is when everybody else creates a digital traceable supply chain and says, oh, I've got one of those too. Right? Because at that juncture, we will have given enough power through our being willing to do it and to have underwritten it and not charged for it, we will have given our customers, the biggest retail brands in the world, the biggest restaurant chains in the world, the biggest travel centers in the country, the biggest C store, we will have given them the power to demand of the entire industry, show me your supply chain on a digitally traceable format so that I know whose coffee you're buying and what price she got and that you didn't use some two dudes locally running the two mills to pinch her head off and profiteer off of her. Prove to me you didn't do that by showing me your digital supply chain. That's the proof in the pudding. And that's why we started the business. And you're the only guy to have asked me that. And that's what I'm actually personally excited about over the next five to 10 years. We'll, we'll make money. We'll do all of that, but that will change the industry. Scott Ford, he's the CEO of West Rock Coffee. Appreciate your candor. And thank you for joining us on Motley Fool Money. Thank you. Thanks for having me.